everyone, and can I welcome uh, members to the 10th meeting in 2017 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, can I also welcome George Adam to the committee today in place of David Torrance, who has sent his apologies. Uh, move now to agenda item one, which is the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016, and we will consider in the first instance uh, the draft of bankruptcy and protected trust deeds miscellaneous amendments Scotland regulations 2017. Members will recall that the committee considered the technical merits of this instrument at its meeting on the 28th of February 2017. The committee has also designated as has been designated as the lead committee for the instrument and today we are invited to consider its policy merits. The instrument amends minor drafting errors in the Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 2016 and the Protected Trust Deed Forms Scotland Regulations 2016 which were identified by our committee in November 2016. At that time the Scottish Government agreed to correct the errors at the next legislative opportunity. Today we are invited to consider this amending instrument. So, today we welcome Paul Wheelhouse, who is the Minister for Business, Innovation and Industry. Good morning and welcome, Minister. We also welcome uh, Graham Fisher, Head of Branch 1, the Constitutional and Civil Law Division, the Scottish Government Legal Directorate. And we also welcome Carol Kirk, Policy Review Team Leader, the Accountant in Bankruptcy. So, I would invite, if I may, Minister, uh, to, wel to welcome you again, and if you would make an opening statement, please. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, everyone. Um, the regulations before you today fulfil a commitment I made to you at the committee meeting on the 1st of November last year. At that meeting, I undertook to bring forward regulations that would amend drafting errors identified in bankruptcy regulations uh, put before this committee. Specifically, the errors drafted at the time, which include missing words and incorrect referencing, are contained in the Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 2016 and the Protected uh, Trust Deeds uh, Forms Scotland Regulations 2016 as part of an exercise to consolidate legislation following the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016. Those measures came into force on the 30th of November last year. And you may recall I fully acknowledged these errors at the time. Uh, as a temporary mitigation, we had taken steps to clarify these errors were appropriate to ensure the legislation is clear for those who use it, including annotating forms available on the accountant and bankruptcy's website with the correct information. However, it's important to put this right formally uh, at this time. And these regulations therefore fix the errors to ensure that the regulations are accurate. And we've taken the opportunity, as I uh, indicated in my letter to the committee, to mend other minor points which stakeholders had raised during the committee's scrutiny as well. Uh, and I'd like to thank the committee uh, for taking the time to consider this instrument this morning. And we are, of course, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Minister. And so do members have any questions? And there being none, I will now move to the debate at item two, which is the consideration of the motion recommending approval of this affirmative instrument. Can I remind officials that they cannot participate in this formal debate on the motion? And can I advise that in accordance with Rule 10.6.3 of Standing Orders, the debate on the motion can last no longer than 90 minutes. Uh, I now invite the Minister to move and speak to motion S5M04390. Uh, Former Minister. Minister. Thank you. Um, I invite contributions from committee members. And uh, there being none... Um, I would like to take this opportunity um, to thank the Scottish Government for addressing uh, these commitments uh, so promptly, uh, Minister. I'm sure you'd have a personal influence on that, no doubt, but uh, nonetheless. Thank, thank the team. I mean, uh, it's, uh, but we're, we're sorry the errors took place in the first place, but uh, we're glad to fix them early. Um, we're very grateful for that consideration. Uh, Minister, would you invite you formally, therefore, to respond to the debate or the lack of it? <laughs> thank you, Convener. I thank the committee for its attention. Right, thank you. Um, so, um, can I now ask the uh, members um, to approve the motion, um, if we are all content so to do? And 
And so the the, que the, the question is, motion S5M04390, um, can we recommend that the draft bankruptcy and protected trustees miscellaneous amendment Scotland regulation 2017 be approved? Does the committee agree to the motion? Agreed. Thank you. Minister, can I thank you and your officials for attending the meeting today and briefly suspend the meeting now to allow you to leave and others to come forward. Thank you again, Minister. Uh, we will uh, start again, and the next item on our agenda is our second consideration of oral evidence on the contract third party rights Scotland Bill at stage one. Um, today we welcome on our first panel Ross Anderson from the Faculty of Advocates and John McLeod, uh, who's a lecturer in commercial law from the University of Glasgow who is representing the Law Society of Scotland today. So can I begin uh, by inviting questions from members? And I have the first question myself, uh, to which we now come. And if I might ask uh, you both, please, um, about, as you know, the, the Scottish rules on third party rights are currently based on the common law. Uh, the Bill team and the Scottish Law Commission have argued that case law is unlikely to develop quickly enough to deal with the problems identified in the law and that statutory rules are needed. Do you agree? Well, let me um, begin um, to answer that question. Uh, the short answer is yes, we do agree. Um, the reason for that is the existing uh, authority on the subject is a House of Lords decision from 1920, which makes development of the law very difficult uh, unless a litigant is willing and able to take matters to the equivalent of the House of Lords today, which is the UK Supreme Court. Thank you very much. Mr McLeod, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, um, not a great deal, M merely that, uh, as the, the Commission uh, suggests in the report, um, there has been a bit of a tendency to, to choose uh, English law as a way of getting round the mm. problems or to use other workarounds. And insofar as parties continue to do that, the core law relating to third party rights is not being used. And therefore, it's, there's going to be very little opportunity for litigation, even were there parties with deep enough pockets to, to deal with the matter. So it's, I don't see any prospect of a Supreme Court case on, on these issues. Right, uh, that's great. Um, thank you very much. We'll move now to our next uh, questions, uh, group of questions from Alison Harris, please. Morning. One of the main criticisms of relying on common law is that there's uncertainty about the scope of the law. Would you agree with that criticism and to what extent do you think the law needs to be clarified in legislation? In short, I do agree with that criticism. Okay. Um, I think there is a lack of clarity on a number of levels. Um, I think the first difficulty is a lack of clarity as to what the law actually is. Mm. Um, I think there is a difficulty in understanding what, um, or a difficulty in interpreting what the existing case law requires in practice. Um, the committee will be aware of the Law Commission's report where they set out one of the difficulties is this conflation of ideas between creating a right and rendering it irrevocable 
and in practice that causes innumerable difficulties. Um, so there is a lack of clarity in understanding what the law is and therefore a lack of clarity in, in providing solutions and practice. Okay. So, could I, given that the bill seeks to provide greater cl clarity, do you think the provisions in the bill are clear and resolve some of the uncertainty associated with the current law? In broad terms, yes. Um, at this juncture, it might be most useful if on the points of detail I simply refer to, I think, some of the written comments which the faculty um, have made to uh, the committee's consultation on particular points of detail. But in, in broad terms, we've, we welcome the bill. Um, we think it is a positive development and we think as a matter of policy uh, and as a matter of achieving its aims, it, it's successful in doing that. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. McLeod, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I mean, largely to, to echo those comments. I, I mean, I, th I think in terms of accessibility um, of, of the law, there is value in these rules being set out in statute, just because statutory material is often much easier to handle than the present position where you have to sort of read a case from the 1920s, think about how a writer from the 17th century was commented on in that case. It, it, it's not accessible, and you can see that in the... Um, doubts expressed in the major text that practitioners um, rely on in this area. Um, on the, the core issue of um, the requirement that a right be irrevocable in order to be created, um, the, the bill deals with that very clearly in, in section one, so it's a, a massive step forward. Um, I'd agree that there are, there are some points of, of detail where perhaps the signalling within the bill might make the rules a little bit more accessible. But uh, on the whole, it's, it's a, a vast step forward in terms of clarity and accessibility. And, and a vast step forward in terms of uncertainty. Are there any other areas of uncertainty that, that you or Mr Anderson would just like for the official report, as it were, to read in um, to the official report that you would like to discuss? Or are you happy? With in, in, in relation to, to, the, to the current law? Yes. Um, I, I mean, the main, the main issue, to my mind, is or it's kind of twofold, but the, the two things have, as Mr Anderson said, being, or Dr Anderson said rather, um, being kind of tied together, um, na namely um, whether a, a right needs to be irrevocable and thus kind of fixed and unchangeable in order to be created. Uh, that causes problems at the outset because people are not sure as to what they need to do in order to, to create these kind of third party rights, um, but it also um, has the potential to cause problems later on when they wonder if it's possible to, to vary it and, and they have questions about what steps they need to go through to change that. Um, so I think it, it's clear that things are much better, or would be much better, were this bill to become law. OK, thank you very much uh, in that regard. Um, we now move to uh, our next uh, group of questions. Mr McMillan, please. Uh, thank, you. <coughs> thank you, Convener. Just on that uh, point, uh, Mr McLeod, when you mentioned about the irrevocable, um, certainly Section 2 of the Bill abolishes the, the irrevocability the rule so that contracts granting third-party rights can be cancelled uh, or modified. And So just with what you said a few moments ago, do you actually support uh, the abolition of this rule? Um, yes. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it's... It, it's important to um, to bear in mind that the ability to revoke rights is restricted, so there are protections for the third parties um, late, later on in the bill. But um, as a general, a matter of general law, outside the third party context, for instance, in Scotland, I can make um, a binding promise to you, which is, is unilateral, and at that point you have a right. But it's um, possible also for me to make that promise in such terms as to make it subject to revocation or to modification in certain circumstances. So really what the bill does here is to move the law of third party rights to bring it in line with the law that generally applies to voluntarily created rights in the law more broadly. So it, it restores or improves the consistency and coherence of the law, to my mind. Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said, although the rule in relation to constitution of a third party right is abolished by section 2. The bill will not prevent parties from creating irrevocable rights if that's what they so choose to do. Okay. But what it does is it removes the tie 
of creation to irrevocability, which was the problem with the law. So it, it addresses the problem without going too far, essentially. Okay. Um, do you, with what you just said there, do, do you think that, uh, uh, that the bill um, could be strengthened uh, in that regard, or are you content with what the bill actually states? Uh, on that particular point, uh, for our part, we're, we're content with what the bill actually states. Okay. Um, the, certainly the provisions in the bill uh, set out in general terms that the default position, uh, the contracting parties are free to make uh, express provisions uh, to the contrary. Uh, do you agree with this particular approach? We do, yes. Um, the whole law of third party uh, rights, to use that general expression, is fundamentally based on party autonomy. Um, the bill provides a framework for the parties to use and it's really for the parties to decide whether to use it. Um, there's no obligation uh, to use this framework, uh, but insofar as the framework is engaged, it's then for the parties uh, to formulate the rights which they wish to create. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think the only thing that I, I'd like to add to that is that it's important to bear in mind that um, you can't impose a third party obligation using this bill. So anything that the third party gets is in some sense a windfall. Okay, the, the, all, all the, the, the contracting parties can do is, is give them something that they didn't have uh, before, uh, and therefore we're pretty relaxed about the um, the contracting parties being able to 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 restrict that. And provided that the terms of potential modification are clear at the outset, we don't see um, problems with the power of modification. Because at the end of the whole process, whatever happens, the third parties are going to be no worse off than they were in the first place. Uh, and, uh, gentlemen, at sections four to six of the bill, uh, stop the contracting parties modifying or cancelling a third party right. Mm -hmm. uh, do these sections provide the right balance uh, between the rights of contracting parties to change their mind and the rights of third parties? Yes, I think, in short, it does. Um, I think those provisions mirror, to a large extent, the existing law which is contained in Section 1 of the Requirements of Writing Scotland Act in relation to situations uh, where reliance has been placed uh, on uh, rights which have been granted but haven't complied with formalities. So there's an element of continuity in those provisions. Um, in addition, in any event, going back to the general principle of party autonomy, uh, the parties, uh, uh, as I've already uh, indicated, are free essentially to contract out of those, those provisions themselves. So, um, uh, again, uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, we are content with the, the, the correct balance has been struck. OK. Yeah. Excellent. Many thanks. That's um, very clear. I'm grateful to you for that. Uh, now move on to the next uh, group of questions. Uh, Monica Lennon, please, Monica. Thanks, Convener. Good morning. The policy memorandum, it states that the legislation will promote um, the greater use of, of Scots law. But understand that people will remain free to, to use English law if they wish or if they prefer. So based on your experience, do you think the proposed legislation will promote greater use of Scots law? I, I think so, yes, in short. Um, I mean, it's always difficult to predict the, the future. Mm. Um, and probably um, colleagues who are um, um, from the solicitor's profession who will be giving evidence that in the next session will be able to comment more specifically um, on uh, any changes in practice that they can envisage in, in, in their um, uh, sectors. The brief I have from, from the Law Society is, is to talk kind of in, in general terms. But we can look, for instance, at the, um, the Legal Writings Counterparts Scotland Act, which clarified a, a point of law where you could have made a case for arguing that the law was basically what the, the, the Act provided anyway. But um, the evidence that the, the, um, uh, the law society has received is that there has been an increase uh, in usage just as, as a result of placing the law on, on a clear and a statutory basis. Um, I think it would increase solicitors' confidence in terms of uh, advising clients to, to use uh, Scots law um, because they can find all the rules in an easily um, a accessible place. Uh, also, the lack of flexibility that the, the irrevocability rule um, certainly was perceived as creating, probably um, did create, meant that some parties had a, a strong incentive not to use Scots law 
because of, of that problem, um, or not to use the most um, efficient and simple um, technique in Scots law. And if you take those barriers away, then it makes people, it makes it easier for people to contract using Scots law. And therefore, one would expect that there will be an increase uh, in use of Scots law for those reasons. Okay, can I ask Ross Anderson the same question, but also can you think of circumstances where it would be preferable to use English law rather than you know, this, this new legislation if it comes forward? Um, let, let me address first the, the initial question and then I'll, I'll come to that supplementary point. Um, I mean, I agree with what's being said. I mean, the, the general principle in relation to choice of law is party autonomy and freedom of choice. Um, the parties are free to choose English law in the same way. Ultimately, they're free to choose German law, French law, the law of New York or anywhere else they choose. If they have an arbitration clause, they can actually choose a, a non-state law. Um, th the key point, I think, in relation to the bill has been perhaps not so much to try and attract other people from around the world to come to choose Scots law, but to ensure that those who would otherwise simply wish to use Scots law, because they're businesses who are based here, the contracts will be performed here, um, is that Scots law provides the tools within itself to allow them to achieve what they wish to achieve without having to, in an artificial sense, use some foreign law, whether that's English law or, or, or any other law. Um, I think the other point that's important to make is that whereas sophisticated parties who have the benefit of sophisticated advice from perhaps some of those sitting behind me will always be able to work um, come up with some sort of workaround to any lacuna in the law. Those who don't have the benefit of that advice at the moment are in a difficult position because the law is so unclear. And I think one of the great advantages of the bill is that it sets out in modern language what the, the law actually is. Um, the supplementary question you asked in relation to English law, um, was it for particular examples? For, <coughs> forgive me, I've already... Yeah, it was just to um, try and identify the circumstances in which um, um, people trying to access the law or, or lawyers would, would refer or use English law instead of Scots law. Well, I think if the bill is passed in, in substantially the form that it is in, um, I think the incentive to do that simply to deal with the difficulties with third party rights will simply disappear. There may be other reasons why parties choose English law for a particular project because it's UK wide and England at the end of the day is bigger than Scotland. Um, or for other reasons one simply isn't aware about to do with the requirements of a funder or something else. But insofar at the moment the sole incentive for choosing English law in a practical situation where one may want to ensure that one has enforceable third party rights. I think one of the um, beneficial effects of the bill will be to remove that incentive. Okay, thank you for that. Mr Anderson, you briefly mentioned workarounds, uh, particularly in the context of people who can perhaps um, afford um, more sophisticated uh, advice. Will there continue to be a reliance on workarounds? I mean, are we going to see a shift away from from using workarounds realistically? Um, I think to adopt what John McLeod's already said, it's, diff it's difficult to predict the future because to, to some extent where parties um, involved in, say, construction projects are used to taking, for example, collateral warranties, standard document, there's a practice which has grown up around using those. For some time they may continue to do so. But insofar as there are additional transaction costs and inconvenience from having to sign these additional documents, one would expect rational economic op operators uh, to change their practice. Um, and I think it's fair to say anecdotally from speaking to colleagues in the legal profession at least, is that they would envisage making use of the bill uh, to avoid some of these workarounds. Um, and beyond that, I think it's, it's, um, it's difficult to say much. I, th I think you may hear later from Professor Beale um, from University of Warwick, who previously, I think, undertook some research in England after the 1999 Act was introduced there mm -hmm. to see what the lag time was where practice altered to reflect the remedies which were, or the, or the um, substantive content of the, the 1999 Act. Okay. Well, it sounds like you agree with the Scottish Law Commission that third-party 
rights are preferable to collateral warranties. Can I maybe I should just explain what are the problems with collateral warranties? Is it is it the costs? That's one of the difficulties. Wh wherever one has extra documents to sign at different times, um, particularly where the signatory of that document may only have come into existence some years after the initial project documents were uh, concluded, there may simply be also the difficulty of getting people to sign up to them when there may not be a huge incentive in monetary terms to do so. So it's general transaction costs and inconvenience, uh, I think, um, is the easiest way to explain that. And I think that would go for other sectors which use different workarounds. Wherever you need an additional document or an additional step, there is a cost. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr McLeod, is that a view you would share if you uh, want? Absolutely, to? yes. It's, it's better to do something directly than indirectly. Pretty much always, I would say. Thank you. Um, could I just um, bring in a supplementary there and um, uh, note that the SLC has indicated that the bill will make it easier for business to avoid what it calls the black hole of non-liability, which currently reduces protection for company groups. Um, do you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Um, would you like me to talk about what the black hole of yeah, liability I would, is? Yes, uh -huh. <laughs> expand on that. Yeah. So. Um, an example might, for instance, be a construction project where um, the, uh, one company within the group um, concludes a contract with contractors to do um, works for properties held by a number of other companies within that group. Unless you use collateral warranties or some other device to set up additional contractual rights, the issue is there that if the contractor doesn't do their job properly and breaches the contract, the contractual right is held by the, the head company, the first company that concluded the contract, but the losses will be suffered by different legal persons, by other companies within that group. Um, and therefore, you have a mismatch, if you like, between the person suffering the loss and the person with the right to enforce. But typically, when you're suing for breach of contract, you are suing, if you're seeking damages, you, you seek damages that reflect the loss that you have yourself suffered, not the losses that someone else it has suffered. So the black hole refers to the, basically the loss going somewhere that isn't covered by the contractual right. If you use the scheme, well, if you use third-party rights, but the new shiny, exciting third-party rights that we have in this bill, then at the outset you would create rights in favour of all of the companies within the groups with respect to their relevant properties, and that would enable them to enforce um, a claim for breach of contract. Um, and thus to recover their, their full damages. Basically, that's how it would work. And the right, it would make things much easier. So this would be progress then? Yes. I, I mean, you could do some of that already if you're willing to use the use quasitum tertio, but people will be more willing to use, or we hope people will be more willing to use the new uh, approach because once you take away an automatic irrevocability rule, you can create those rights, but still leave it open to the main, to the initially instructing company to modify the contract with the contractor if that's appropriate. So you get the best of both worlds: the right to cover the damages, but also flexibility between the constructor and the, the head company in the group. I suppose one of the things we're seeking to establish is that we are striking the right balance here uh, in the bill as proposed, and um, we're, I suppose, seeking your endorsement that we are managing to achieve that. Uh, yeah, and, and then again, you would think that, that we have struck the right yeah. balance. I mean, as, as um, Dr. Anderson um, said, ultimately, this is all coming back to party autonomy. You know, almost every section is subject to the, to the party's agreement. So in ultimate terms, it's going to be for the parties themselves to, to strike the balance. But that's appropriate. You know, if, if we believe in, uh, in an economy that's driven by freely negotiated contracts, then, then the party's balance is the right balance unless you're in a specific situation where you have reason to doubt that. But this, this is the general law, it's not consumer law, it's not labour law, so there's no reason to try and fiddle with the balance between the parties. OK, thank you. Anything you wish to add, Dr Anderson, are you happy? I don't have much to add. I, I endorse the, the balance which the bill seeks to strike. The only caveat to black hole liability, which, believe you me, is as unpleasant as it sounds in practice, is... Um, 
Third party rights won't solve all issues of black hole liability um, because there will be situations where the parties have, uh, have not envisaged something that will happen subsequently. The classic examples where one of the parties is restructured, <coughs> whether voluntarily or involuntarily, a bank, for example, <coughs> and the, the contract when it was concluded in year one um, uh, may not have made provision for that particular eventuality of a completely different party coming to hold the contractual rights. But this bill can't achieve everything. Insofar as there's a problem with black hole liability in relation to third party rights, this bill will go some way to solving that. Notwithstanding what you just said, we are here to try and make as good a bill as we possibly can. And therefore, if you have uh, suggestions that we might make, uh, or improvements that we might make, and we're very pleased to hear from you um, now in that regard, or um, subsequently, if you have uh, an elegant uh, an improvement to make to um, the bill as we see it, we will amend the bill at, at stage two. We're very grateful for that opportunity. To be clear, though, in, in what I've just said, I'm not seeking actually really in any way to criticise no, the bill. It, it's really just an, an issue of um, as much as the bill can achieve under the law of third party rights. The point about black hole liability is that it's not just about third party rights. And there are other situations which this bill could never achieve without opening up wider areas of the law with which it is not, not concerned. Um, so again, simply to re-emphasise that I think as far as third party rights are concerned, I think the bill does strike the right balance in seeking to address that particular problem. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is it you just, content? Just say, I, th I think um, what we said is, is correct that the, the other types of black hole situations are beyond the scope of this bill, right. and it would really it would spoil the bill to try and, and deal with them here. I, um, I, I believe Professor McQueen gave evidence that the Scottish Law Commission are considering the broader issues as part of another project, and you would be sh best advised, I think, to, to wait for them to report on that matter and to deal with it once it's been properly considered. Uh, That's uh, very helpful. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr Adam, if you'd like to ask your questions now, please. Good evening. Good morning. Uh, the Scottish Law Commission report refers to the new rules having the biggest impact in the construction industry. You've already given a couple of examples yourself. Uh, industry, uh, obviously oil and gas, financial services, IT and pension sectors. Are there any other sectors or industries that where the legislation could be important? Um, I, I don't have spe specific data to hand. I, c I can seek it fr from the... The, the law society, if you wish. I mean, this, this is general contract law. So in principle, any time where you have two parties agreeing and a third party that they want to be able to enforce, this could be useful. Um, that could happen, I guess, in certain agricultural contexts, if you have um, a contractor and an estate and then uh, a, a tenant farmer, potentially. Um, the, the examples that the, the, the Commission gave, I think, are, are the, the main examples where you tend to have a complex um, relationship between, with multi-party um, contracts. Uh, but I, I think it, Is it, that it, why construction is such an easy example, then? Because yeah. that's just, a, just to get it right in my own head. Yeah. You know, there's so many subcontractors and everybody else involved then as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and similarly with, with, with finance contracts, you have lots of parties with all slightly different sets of interest, lots of different legal persons um, being used. But, but, I mean, you could have that in any number of, of contexts, I think. Um, what matters is to get the general principles correct. Do um, we think the bill could benefit individuals as well? You know, I know I'm kind of asking you to look in a crystal ball, but there probably could be a case where individuals could uh, benefit from this as well, isn't there? Well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the example that they give of pensions, mm -hmm. um, that, that seems to be the... the Oh, the, the core example, they, they give another example, if I recall correctly, uh, about a, a caregiver uh, procuring uh, services uh, for somebody who is um, who's mentally impaired and, and therefore um, doesn't have active capacity themselves. Um, so, the, and again, that's just off the top of my head, but there's a, a couple of examples of situations where one person needs to contract on behalf of another. Um, and those are the most obvious. Come to my mind. I don't really have, have much to add. For presentational purposes, one talks about sectors and the particular problems which arise in particular sectors, and the construction industry is a good example to use because it's relatively easy to explain the different contractual matrices. 
but in broad terms, the, the bill applies to all persons, natural and legal, whatever context they are entering into contracts. Uh, and it would apply equally to a construction contract as it would to a domestic arrangement in relation to two people buying a house and it being funded by a third party um, for, is one of the examples given in, in the Commission's report. And certainly from my own experience, um, practising before the courts, it's very often actually individuals who have not had the benefit of detailed or sophisticated advice who have probably assumed that uh, it should be quite easy to confer a third party right and perhaps to their cost found out that they haven't complied with quite the detail of Lord Dunedin's speech in, in the case which is referred to. Um, and so again, I think for those for ordinary citizens, I think there is a benefit to this bill in recording in simple and modern language what the law actually is. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, I, I think, I hope I'm reassured, given that it will be impossible to envisage every um, situation to which this bill might apply, but it, therefore it is important that we establish the general principles. And I am, I hope, if I've understood you correctly, reassured that you believe that we ha are managing to do that um, in the bill as proposed. That is correct. Right, thank you. Uh, I've got a couple of more questions. Uh, one about uh, arbitration. Uh, do you have any comments on Section 9 of the Bill which allows arbitration agreements between contracting parties to operate in respect of third party rights? This, this was a matter which um, the faculty, when we responded, um, made some comments, really comments of detail in relation to drafting, uh, I think, more than major points of principle. Um, the issues which arrive, which arise, are can be somewhat complex to explain. Um, I'm, I'm certainly happy to do so. Um, the particular drafting issue which um, uh, arises uh, is found in um, section nine three of the bill, um, and. Rather than giving you a long explanation of why this arises, the easiest way to explain it uh, may be simply to observe that the explanatory notes uh, in relation to section 9, subsection 3, uh, point out uh, correctly that um, that particular provision uh, is really designed to deal with a situation, um, I, I think it's paragraph 38 or so of the explanatory notes, um, are designed to deal with a situation where the third party uh, doesn't actually have a substantive right under the contract, uh, but may otherwise have a procedural right uh, to, um, uh, to invoke the arbitration agreement. So the drafting point is a very short one, actually, which is in subparagraph C, which... Uh, relates to the, the use of the term third party right there. Um, and we've made reference to this in our written uh, response. So that should be um, before the committee for more detailed deliberations. Um, again, more broadly though, to maybe stand back from the detail and look at the policy and what the, 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 the section seeks to achieve. Um, in broad terms, this is uh, consistent with the international trend uh, in relation to I suppose moving away from privity uh, for the purposes uh, of arbitration and um, it confers the, the option uh, on a third party uh, who wishes to enforce a third party right uh, and needs to enforce it, um, that party thereby becomes a, a, a party to the arbitration uh, agreement uh, and can enforce it and similarly if, if that party does enforce the arbitration agreement uh, or seeks to sue the party who um, uh, is due to render performance, the arbitration agreement can be invoked against the third party. Um, and that again is consistent with the international trend and indeed the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010, which uh, this parliament uh, passed in accordance with, again, the general uh, international trend. So again, subject to the small drafting point in relation to section nine, subsection three C, uh, which we have referred to in our written um, uh, evidence to the committee. Uh, we are again broadly in favour of the uh, approach which is taken to, to the arbitration provisions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Cloud, anything you wish to add in that regard? 
Fine, great. Um, and what, just finally, a question on the speed of law reform. And from the evidence we've received, it seems that some of the problems in Scots law, third party rights have been in, in existence since at least the Second World War, possibly before. On that basis, do you think there is an argument? Um, or do, would you adhere to the view that the pace of law reform in this area has been a little too slow? I think you have to be quite careful in terms of striking a balance between trying to go fast and making sure that you get it right. Um, so it's true that, that law reform in these areas uh, has been slow. It is also true that while suboptimal, the defects in law have not um, crippled the Scottish economy. Um, and as such, therefore, I think it's better for us to for, or for those involved in law reform uh, to take their time and to make sure that they have thought carefully about the uh, full implications of what they're doing um, so that we don't end up having to return to the matter in 10 or, or 20 uh, years' time, uh, particularly in terms of areas of law where we're dealing with big general principles. Um, there is value in stability uh, as well as in, in modernity. Uh, and therefore, I, I think we should be careful to, to criticise those involved in law reform for, for being too slow because that would be liable to make them rush and then we just end up doing something that's quite slow twice rather than taking a long time but getting it right. OK, thank you very much. Dr um, Anderson. Broadly agree. I did, um, in, in preparation for coming to the committee, I did have occasion to look at um, some of the passages in Hansard when the 1999 Act was passed in England and it's interesting to note that one of the justifications given by the government at that juncture was to bring English law into line with what was perceived to be Scots law. Um, <laughs> the uh, point about law reform more generally, though, I think, uh, as John McLeod has touched upon, uh, is that it, it is important to get it right rather than to reform for the sake of reform. Um, and I, I think the other contemporary circumstance, which is interesting, is that it's really in the last uh, 10 to 20 years that there's been quite considerable international development, that's to say collaborative work, uh, which has gone into international benchmark instruments, which has allowed bodies like the Scottish Law Commission to look um, in a quite focused way uh, at particular aspects of Scottish contract law and to see how we measure up. Um, and insofar as this parliament is considering reforming the law, um, I think I would observe that it's not alone in that regard. Uh, and one can look, for example, to France, where there's the famous We Read Book of the Code Civil, um, which has been in, in force for 200 years. And in uh, October of this year, it's had one of its most fundamental reforms, all in the area of contract law. Um, uh, so Scots law is not alone in, in, in looking at these matters right now. Uh, but again, in a broad sense, from the faculty's perspective, we, we welcome the fact that the Parliament is now seriously looking at the good work that the Scottish Law Commission has done in these focused areas. Um, uh, and uh, we uh, would encourage the Parliament and this committee to do so. Thank you very much. Oh, Stuart, Mr. <coughs> Mimmel. Thank you. Mr. Anderson, just on that point, um, are you aware of any incidents or examples uh, of other countries looking at this SLC and the recommendations from the SLC uh, to this Parliament uh, so that they can actually uh, potentially adopt uh, the measures uh, that, uh, that, are, that are taking place in Scotland? In, in short, speaking from my own experience, um, I, I do know, for example, that in relation to um, the UNIDWA principles of international commercial contracts. UNIDWA is an international body based in Rome about the <coughs> unification of private law. It's one of the standard benchmark instruments. Uh, and certainly in the commentary on the third party rights principles, uh, the last edition of that, um, that commentary did make uh, quite interesting reference to uh, the reforms that were being proposed. But at that stage, it was the discussion paper that had been produced by the Scottish Law Commission. Um, so I think it's um, we've been fortunate that the quality of, that the, of work that the Law Commission has been doing in recent years is such as that it is uh, internationally recognised for what it's doing. 
I think whether the bill or, or, the, or the legislation itself will influence developments elsewhere is difficult to say. One always has local differences of approach to how one formulates uh, legislation. Um, the continental approach is normally to have much shorter, concise provisions, for example. Um, but I, I, I think the development that one sees in the, the Law Commission's work uh, and in the bill is really more of a collaborative one um, of developing in tandem with uh, international consensus. Well, thank you. Well, um, gentlemen, thank you very much for your evidence, and uh, particularly thank you for placing um, in your final comments there um, this bill in the context of, of, of Napoleonic law and other uh, law as well. Uh, we're very grateful to you both uh, for taking the trouble to come through um, to our Parliament here this morning and I wish you a safe journey home, but thank you again for your evidence. If, having said that, if there is anything that occurs to you um, on your way home or subsequently that uh, you might wish to add, um, please do um, let us know uh, wh what that might be uh, and feel free to do so. But again, our grateful thanks meantime for your help this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'll just suspend uh, the meeting briefly uh, to allow the witnesses to leave. Um, well, um, can I now welcome our next panel uh, to provide evidence on the contract Third Party Rights Scotland Bill, and they are representatives uh, from legal firms. So can I welcome uh, Kenneth Rose, who's a partner of CMS Cameron McKenna, LLP. Can I also welcome Karen Fountain, who's a partner at Brodie's, LLP. Can I also welcome Jonathan Gaskell, who's a legal director of DLA Piper, and Karen Manning, who's the senior associate at Burness Paul. So, um, I would now like to um, start questioning uh, you, if I may, and uh, the first question um, I have, and it's um, about alternative approaches to uh, statutory footing of common law. Uh, and the Bill team and the Scottish Law Commission have indicated that case law is unlikely to develop quickly enough to deal with the problems identified in the law and that statutory rules are needed. Do you agree with this statement? Who would like to go first? Uh, yes. Thank you, Karen. Um, I would say it is. Um, as um, well, when, when you're advising a client, you, you can't recommend that they take a course of action which will become certain only if they follow it through to the Supreme Court. That's just not a credible proposition. So if you're trying to achieve with confidence a third party right with um, some flexibility within it where we have a problem with the current law, you will tend to use a workaround, and if you use a workaround, then in the event of a dispute, there won't be case law on third party rights, there'll be case law on something else. So it, it simply won't develop. Thank you. And would others like to contribute? I would say, as a lawyer, lawyers tend to be quite risk averse creatures, and I suppose we 
don't like to advise clients in areas of law that are not particularly certain. And I think this particular area of law, the common law, um, th there's no recent case law. So there is a lot of uncertainty around that. I think institutions don't like uncertainty. Businesses don't like uncertainty. I think this is one of the reasons why <coughs> there's not a reliance in general terms, certainly in my, my sector, which is construction, there's not a reliance on third party rights of common law. And for that reason, I think this particular, this proposed bill is, is a good thing in that it codifies the existing law and it gives certainty. And I think businesses, individuals, people working within the industry like, like certainty. Excellent. Um, does that express the view of um, of you all, Mr. Rose. Um. I, think, I think the the challenge for Scots law as a whole, I think, is because of, if you got a common law system, you're very dependent. As we've touched on this before, about people actually having inclination to take a case to court and that that case being pursued right up to the Supreme Court. I think that given the size of our jurisdiction, there are challenges about how quickly that process can can move the law. Uh, I think there are also, you know, I speak as a, a corporate commercial lawyer here, um, rather than one that specialises in construction. Um, actually, a lot of of, of uh, those um, relationships are governed by usually English law, but extraneous law quite often, in, even within Scotland between two Scottish parties. And that's nothing to do necessarily to do with third party rights as such. But what that does mean is that there is even less potential for case law and, uh, and common law to develop law. So approaching it through a, a legislative process and a sort of step change, and we're bearing in mind it's almost 100 years since the last step on this, on, on this change of, of third party rights, seems to me to be a logical way to approach things. Fine. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Manning. I wholeheartedly agree with everything that's been said. I mean, I myself am also a construction expert and I have never come across the use of the GQT principle to confer third party rights on a person. And although that's construction specific, uh, I'm pretty confident that that position um, is not an unusual one for lawyers in in Scotland today, so it seems generally accepted that um, GQT is not is not fit for purpose. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Well, that's clear um, and conclusive, which is also welcome. Uh, now move to uh, Alison Harris, who's got um, a questions. I just was really coming from my question, similarly as I did with the Law Society and Faculty of Advocates. I think you really touched on it with relation to common law, but if just so I'm clear. If one of the main criticisms of relying on common law is that it does create uncertainty about the scope of the law, you know, as legal practitioners, would you say that this well, would you agree with this criticism? I know, well, but I think you possibly were agreeing with it. But to what extent do you think it needs to be clarified in the legislation? I think if we're talking about third-party rights mm. in, in specifically, then yes. yes, I think I think the case law got itself into a, a, a bit of confusion in the 1920s, that there hasn't been the throughput of cases looking at the issue to resolve that. Had there been, um, we might not be in this position and, and it may have reintegrated itself into the general conceptual stream of, of contract law, but, but it hasn't. It's got itself into a bit of a dead end. And okay. the, the way to take it out most quickly and certainly, I think, would be to put it on a statutory footing. That seems to be the way people have gone in other jurisdictions, and it the draft legislation helpfully codifies the law and takes it back to the basic principle that people should be able to enter into whichever contractual and promissory rights they want as long as they write it down. It's it's effectively taking it back to the you know the Ron Seal moment. The contract should do what it says on the tin, and at the moment you can't be confident that that's the case. You need to be confident. I mean, if, you, if it's important enough to draft a contract, it's important enough to be confident that it'll work. And so th there is a general practice of, of work around. And, and that in itself is not a helpful situation because if you try and achieve something indirectly, rather than simply writing down, you know, X, Y, and Z will be the case, if you try and achieve it in another way, it will usually have additional ramifications which you don't necessarily want. So. Um, one way of dealing with third party rights in the types of contracts I deal with is to, to interpose a trust for the benefit of third parties. But that's not 
always exactly what you want to achieve. It brings in fiduciary entitlements, which you may not wish to be there, and it, it muddies up some of the conflict positions. So it's much better to take it back to the original basic principles of, of okay. party autonomy, I think. Thank you. OK, anyone else? Does everyone agree? <laughs> yeah. Well, given that the bill seeks to provide greater clarity, then do you think that the provisions in the bill are clear and they do actually resolve some of the uncertainty associated with the current law? Think that? Yes. 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 Straightforward. Thank you. <laughs> um, if there's anything you want to discuss, I mean, now's the opportunity, but you're, you're happy with that. I don't think you should give all expectations of any legal reform. Mm -hmm. I think that you have to. I think guide it, guide it through a, a sensible mid-course on this. I mean, this is you are doing a step change, and you are doing something quite fundamental. But that's not a reason not to do that change, and I think explore how it, how it reacts. I think when the 99 Act in England came in, people didn't quite know how they'd react to that. And I know you're going to get evidence on that, so I think you've got to take a decision, get a, a sort of sensible mid-course, something that's not overly complex. I mean, it, that's always in the eye of the beholder. For us lawyers, what, what looks relatively simple can be quite complex to people who are not legal lawyers. But I think you have to take a sensible course, and this looks to me, my personal opinion, as a, as a sort of sensible course to take, which is, which is relatively straightforward compared to what we've got at the moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr McMillan, could you like to ask your okay. questions? Uh, thank you, convener. <coughs> uh, good morning, panel. Um, the provisions in the bill uh, set out in general terms the default position. Uh, the contracting parties are free to make express provisions to the contrary. Uh, do you agree with this approach? I, I completely agree with that position, I think it's important that we don't uh, undermine the essential freedom of parties to, to contract in such a manner as they like, provided they're not doing it in an illegal way, I suppose. I mean, an example that I, I raised in the Scottish Law Commission paper was um, the issue of the ability to, to raise defences. Um, so the counterparty that's been sued by the third party um, c can raise any defence that it would have against the other party to the contract, provided that it's relevant to the claim by the third party. The point that I made in, in the SLP, uh, SLC um, submission that was certainly in, in the construction industry and as far as collateral warranties are concerned, um, that wouldn't be sufficient because you would generally want the ability to exclude any kind of commercial issues between the contracting parties insofar as a third party claim is concerned. And now, those sorts of commercial issues would generally be relevant to the claim by the third party. Um, but because market practice is to exclude them, certainly in collateral warranties, you would want to do a similar thing in third party rights. So you need that sort of basic reservation to um, do as you see fit, I guess, in the contract, um, provided it's, it's sensible and it, it's not illegal. So I, I agree entirely. Yes, I mean, I, I would agree. Also, one of the areas I um, commented on when we gave our initial submissions was we felt it was quite important that there was an ability to contract out of the the right to rely provisions as regards amendments. Um, I, I often deal with very long-term contracts. They might run 10, 12 years, and the ability of the parties to make ongoing finessing changes as they go is really very important. And for some types of clause it's just not viable to, for the parties to, to grant a third party right where they can't then amend the agreement if someone has relied on it because it's, it can give rise to difficult questions of what is reliance if the provision is something like an exclusion of liability or an indemnity. There's a difficult question, at what point did you rely? Is it at the point that you did the thing where something went wrong? Is it the point that the claim arose? It, it's too uncertain. And in those situations, what you'll often want to do is to provide in the contract that any amendments um, simply require the consent of one one person who perhaps represents a constituency and the others have, have to go with it. As long as it's clear on the face of it that that's the position, people should be able to contract for that. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree as well. 
the the bill provides a good a good balance between <coughs> flexibility on the one hand and and certainty on the other and i think that the party autonomy is is key and and that there should be an ability to contract out of that that flexibility to alter third party rights for example um under sections 4 to 6 if the commercial circumstances require that okay um, uh, certainly section 2 of the bill uh, abolishes the uh, irrevocability rule so that uh, contracts granting third party rights can be cancelled or modified and do you support uh, the abolition of this rule? Yes, I think, we, I, think I do. Um, I can't speak for everyone but I think, I think I do. I think it, it was a uh, I think it was unfortunate uh, that in the 1920 Carmichael case that the approach that was taken there, because I, I think it may well have applied to the, the equities of that particular case, but I think the, uh, the, the long-term effect of, of that was to make, contrary to what, what, what some of my colleagues have said, is it created an inflexibility which has, has prevented or hindered the, the, the use of the JQT um, principle, and I think anything which makes it more flexible and, and gets back to the basic principle of, you know, two parties or two or more parties contracting with each other and voluntarily agree a set of obligations and, and rights, then I think that, that does make our, our, law, our legal system more attractive and, and more usable and more user-friendly for, for individual um, parties. Okay. Anyone else? No? Okay, and uh, finally, sections four to six of the bill uh, stop the contracting parties modifying uh, or cancelling a third party right. Do, do these sections provide the right balance uh, between the rights of contracting parties to change their mind and the rights of third parties? Um, well, the, the legislation provides um, for scope for contracting parties to contract out of those reliance provisions provided it's made clear to the third party and I think that ultimately will give sufficient flexibility. Um, w what it will likely mean is the development of sort of standard forum clauses which indicate which bits of the legislation will apply and which bits will be contracted out of and that should give um, everyone this, the certainty that they're getting the mix they want. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. McMillan. Can I just um, declare an interest in this regard? But. Um, John McLeod uh, touched on um, aspects of agricultural law um, in uh, one of uh, his remarks. And I'm just wondering if, um, since we have you in front of us, if you see how you see this um, bill having a bearing on the field of agricultural law. Uh, as I said earlier, we don't want to, uh, we want to make the best law possible and where this parliament has fallen short in, in earlier times has been in areas of agricultural law. So since you're in front of us, would you have anything to say with regard to, to that? In as much as you, um, Karen Fountain, just spoke about um, 10 to 12 year contracts um, dealing with that period. But um, in agricultural law, many of these contracts go on for generations. Um, have you any comments to make on that? Not that you'd like to make. A position of no expertise on agricultural <laughs> law, <laughs> um, but as the owner of a field <laughs> with some interest, um, I would say it takes the concept of contract law back to its original roots in um, the expression of intent and agreement, and that's a helpful tool, and that should be a helpful tool across any industry, um, being able to write down what you want to happen and to have it happen without having to comply with a, a particular technical requirement, which you might not naturally assume would be the case. And in, in any s field of industry where there's a, there's a tendency to disaggregate relationships and subcontract, and I think, I think we do see that happening in agriculture. Um, there's a lot of agribusiness, there's a lot of subcontracting on farms between different um, service providers. That seems to be a bit of a natural home for multi-party relationships where this could be a useful tool. Thanks very much. Would anyone else want to venture into this area of law or not necessarily? So, we have our kind of areas of expertise, indeed. I guess, and it's difficult to stray outside. <laughs> or indeed, I, I perfectly well understand. Uh, thank you very much. Um,
And so we now move uh, to a, a group of questions from Monica Lennon. Um, Monica, if you'd like to fire one. Thanks, convener. Good morning. Um, we've already talked quite a bit already about the practical problems with the, the current law, and you would have heard me ask the previous panel um, about the proposition in the policy memorandum which states that the legislation will promote the use of Scots law. Um, you all seem very on board with this, so I think there's a there's a sort of united uh, um, approach here. But as legal practitioners, um, you know, are you confident that you yourselves and your colleagues will use the law? And you know, can you think of a, a situation with a client where you would continue to use either English law or indeed other workarounds? Maybe I can take this point first because I sort of touched on this earlier. I think there's, there's a specific point here around this particular reform, but there's also the sort of mood, what we call mood music around it all, around Scots law. And lo, lo, legal systems are in competition with each other. And I think that, that I think that's one of the things that has moved on. I think it was touched on by the early set of evidence. And therefore, Scots law doesn't have, has, has to win the right to be relevant to a particular agreement or situation, particularly when we're talking about contractual law. So we can, we can choose English law, we can choose Delaware law, we can choose New York law, and, and all the rest of it. There's a lot of choices now, but, you know, particularly in more significant commercial relationships. So it's important not just the specific reform, and, and we talked about the, the, the counterparts um, reform that's already happened, and there are other ones about requirements of writing and, and, and electronic signatures and things. It's the mood of music of moving the legal system forward is very important in that context. In t and in context of presenting Scots law as a modern form of law that people will readily use. And I, I think why you know, it's important, I mean, I think it, it isn't, and I think I'd be a brave lawyer to sit in front of you and say, the reason for using Scots law is we want more work for Scottish lawyers. That, that isn't really the point. The point here is that you want um, contracting parties in a jurisdiction to be comfortable using the natural law of that jurisdiction, there are generally advantages on that. And I think if you take the advantage of Scots law versus English law, which is the most obvious advantage, the, I would say this, the costs and accessibility of Scots law, are, are, it's, the accessibility is much greater, the costs are much less, actually. So if you're actually encouraging, um, not necessarily intentionally, but by, by, by de facto not having a, a modern legal system that's responsive to change, you do encourage the, the mindset that actually we need to default to another legal system, English law, New York law, whatever it may be. So th there is a sort of longer term aspect of this. This is a step change in this one particular area, but I think that other changes need to happen as well, and we need to be doing that on a progressive basis to present <coughs> Scots law in a modern and progressive way is my, my, my particular view of things. Okay, just to follow up on that, and so how do you encourage people to behave in, in that way and to go in that, in that direction that you've set out? Well, I, I think it, we, need, we as practitioners need to be helped by a, a, a legislature and, and, and reform process within Scots law that supports that. If, if it looks like the legal system we're representing is behind the, the times, then that is more difficult. I, I do go back, I have a bit more perspective on this in, in some respects. I go back to what was happening in England before the 99 Act. In those situations, some people sort of said it as half jokingly, but actually it was true. People in England were, were, were quite, um, uh, compared Scots law quite favourably with English law at that time because we had the, the just quasi item tertio. So that was an advantage, but that was that was levelled out and probably more than levelled out by what happened in ninety nine in, in 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 English English law. So it's just a question of reacting to change, and and actually bringing law sensibly forward in steps, um, to help. Particularly, I, I'm probably focusing where I'm coming at it from, larger commercial parties. But it, it does affect everyone. It's it's not it's more relevant at that level. The choice is more easy to make. It's more easy for people to say, well, we'll. we'll we will use English law and we'll go and disputes will be held, you know, be taken to the English courts or through some form of international arbitration or whatever it might be. But there is a, you know, there's a need to present Scots law as a viable alternative in those situations. And, you know, so it's not just sort of locked in to sort of those non-commercial situations that perhaps it is more, e more immediately relevant. Okay. Just open that to the rest of the panel. Actually, practiced in in England until um, relatively recently, 
um, so I've come back. So, I mean, one of the situations that would often arise um, if there was something that had a bit of a Scottish dimension, it would inexorably find its way to my desk in the same way that my Irish colleagues would inexorably get the Irish questions. And, and often people would, you know, would come in and say, is it OK? They want to do that under Scots law. Will it work? Um, or is it going to be a problem? And the more, the more in a multi-jurisdictional situation, you could say, yes, that's fine. You know, it has some differences, but it'll all come out broadly in the same place then you're taking the decision on which law should apply on more rational reasons around where do I want to enforce, where's the natural locus, rather than, well, yes, that would be fine, but we need to do this little bit here and that's not going to work. And then it artificially skews the decision. I don't think um, we have as much of an issue with that in the construction industry. It seems generally accepted that if the construction project is in Scotland, the law will be Scotland, even without this Third Party Rights Act. And that, that's probably because we have a very established workaround in collateral warranties. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's as relevant, perhaps, in, in the construction and, and engineering industry. I just pick up on the point you just made, Karen uh, Manning. If the um, if it is very established and people are very wedded to collateral uh, warranties in your sector in construction, then is it going to be difficult to to even get clients to start away from that? I, th I think it is. I think it is going to be a challenge. I mean. If you look at the position in England, um, I work on quite a lot of English projects uh, south of the border and the Third Party Rights Act down south isn't used very often. Third party rights aren't used as often as collateral warranties. Now we've had numerous discussions in, in our sector as to why that is and I think there are a number of, of issues. I think there are um, issues south of the border with the Act and I'm glad to see that the third party rights bill here is is different in in some respects which is, is positive. Um, I think there's, there's just gener general change is difficult in anything and when you have such an established approach where the standard position, the market norm is that it will be a suite of collateral warranties which will create these third party rights. It's very difficult just to say, well now we, do, we don't need those, um, instead we will have this, this statute. Um, but I, don't, I think it will be a challenge, but I don't think it will be impossible. And I, I wholeheartedly support the bill. And, um, and I think, you know, in raising awareness um, on, on the bill, if, if, it, if it is passed, and um, I suppose just getting parties to the, the construction parties comfortable um, with using something that might look different, but um, then being aware that it creates essentially the, the, the same protections um, is, is important and will be key. So broadly speaking, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but is it your view that legal practitioners will make use of the legislation and that over time there'll be a reduction in um, reliance on workarounds? I think that's right. I, th I think if you look at the experience of England, and, and Professor Hugh Beale um, is going to talk about that in due course, I, I think it, um, it took a, quite a long time for practitioners and parties to take up uh, use of the 1999 Act. Um, but my, I, mean, I, I do a lot of work in England as well. I'm, I'm English qualified as well as Scots qualified. Um, I find that the 1999 Act is becoming a lot more prevalent and it is being used a lot more for certain types of third parties, such as in the context of a construction project, purchases and tenants. I think the issue um, with the use of third party rights in England comes with the use with their use in the context of funders, because funders typically want the ability to step into a building contract or appointments if it, the project reaches a distress situation. And because third party rights only confer rights, um, a contractor or consultants will want, also want the ability, will want the funder to eff effectively take over the payment obligations under the contracts. And it's not easy to do that using third party rights. So funders are very nervous about using third party rights still. But I certainly, I've been, I, I've been involved, for example, in large shopping centre projects where you've got sort of like dozens and dozens of tenants, and you might have sort of 10 
people involved in the construction of the project, and and you end up with dozens and dozens of clerks warranties, and you know, and and they are and they are administrative nightmare for solicitors. Um, they, they are a management distraction. They incur unnecessary legal costs, and and uh, and it's bad for the environment, frankly. So I, I think it's you know, the use of third-party rights in the context of this sort of legislation is to, is to be applauded and and, um, and promoted. And um, certainly, as a practitioner, if this bill were to be passed in Parliament, I would encourage, I would have no hesitation in recommending to clients that um, it should be used wherever it can. Just on your point, Jonathan Gaskell, because I'm wondering if the bill is enacted, what can be done to, to sort of speed things up? And is it going to be down to people like yourselves to be a, a sort of strong advocate for? I think it has to be practitioners that right, take this okay. on board and, and, and recommend their use to clients. I think that the practitioners have to be in the driving seat. And as Karen mentioned, I think it's incumbent on us to raise the profile uh, and to bring this legislation, if it's passed to people's attention, yeah. um, and, and recommend its use. I mean, it, we have to be in the driving seat as far as okay. I'm concerned. Okay, that's helpful. Just to return to a point that we raised last week with the Law Commission and um, the convener raised earlier um, about this black hole of non-liability. It does sound, oh, rather scary. Um, so the, the Scottish Law Commission has indicated that the bill will make it easier for businesses to avoid this black hole of non-liability. Um, which reduces protection for company groups. Do you all agree with that position? I'll talk maybe first on this one. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a this is a big point actually. Uh, I don't know whether, whether it should be called a black hole or not, but the whole idea of group, of recognising that you know you contract on a group basis quite often, but you don't necessarily have all the group companies as parties to the agreement is is a big one actually. So something which deals more efficiently with allowing individual group companies' rights under those kind of agreements is is a, is a good one, a good one commercially. I think it will help. Um, it will help simplify agreements rather than make them more complex, because there are workarounds around that, using agency and, and other routes. But I think this is a, is a big point, particularly as a corporate practitioner myself, that you know, these are, a lot of the contracts that you enter into aren't just binary between a supplier and, 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 and recipient of those supplies. They can be very much around group group contracting. New companies may come into a group, may be formed from scratch, may be acquired, may be disposed of. So anything that's flexible around, uh, that acknowledges the fact that other companies within that group can can, rec can enforce rights and in certain circumstances, and I think as, as negotiated between the parties, I think is a good one and a flexible one. Yes, I agree. I mean, it does enable you to, uh, as the, the faculty said, it, it won't, necessarily um, resolve every problem um, because it's only going to resolve such problems as you're able to anticipate and legislate for but there's a, a current category of obvious problems <laughs> around um, around group group arrangements which at least it will enable you to to work with okay um while i've got you all here just a sort of final question because i think one of the challenges looking at this piece of work is it's difficult to sort of quantify the extent to which all oh, this is a problem and, and who is it affecting but given how people here that work uh, in construction i think across the finance sector too what sort of impact um does this black hole of non-liability have on your clients well for me um the client obviously we have the very established workaround of collateral warranties which covers the black hole issue so where there are collateral warranties there there isn't as much of a problem um but certainly it's it's welcomed um for the, in the instances where perhaps there are there is provision for collateral warranties to be granted but they don't um materialize which is relatively common thank you um monica um Alison, uh, Alison Harris, if you'd like to ask your question now, please. I would, like to, well, I would like to ask about the Scottish Law Commission has indicated that b the bill will benefit the financial services sector, you know, for example, in relation to pensions and insurance contracts. So do you agree with that view? And are there any other areas of the financial services which you feel may also benefit? Well, I, I think financial products and financial services arrangements are, are often quite complicated. There'll tend to be mul multiple parties in them. Um, so even from within the 
the sort of internal mechanisms of organisations. It's a useful additional flexibility um, for their internal arrangements. For for customer facing products, um, yes, you, you often have the position where the party who enters into a financial arrangement is doing so in part with a view to benefiting successors, family, and so on, and having something else that you can use <clears throat> over and above probably the trust mechanism, which, which is a common workaround, um, it is helpful. Um, so yes, I, th I think so. Anyone else, Scott? No. Yeah, I think uh, the financial services sector has a lot of different aspects to it, and, and I think that, that um, a lot of the aspects I would come across probably aren't so much customer facing, it's probably in, industry to industry, and, and I think it's definitely, again, it gets back to the kind of, at the moment I would say that a lot of uh, relationships at a commercial level in, in financial services are not governed by Scots law even between different Scottish entities. So anything, again, that sort of in, it makes the, the Scottish legal system appear more flexible and more modern will mean it, it's more likely to be used. Uh, how the direct benefit of that probably is back to the question of the forum for any disputes and, and access to, 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 to resolution, I think, is easier, clearly, if you use a, 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 a local system rather than a, a system from somewhere else. But I think it, it's not a, I don't think it's a very, bin, it's not a very binary, change. I don't think this one change will make a massive amount of difference in, in that suggestion, but it's, it's part of a sort of journey, if you like, and a process. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thank you. Right, thank you, thank you very much. Everyone happy with that? Right, um, and finally, or not finally, but we'll move now to uh, George Adam, who has questions on benefits for individuals. Yes, Mr. Adam. Uh, thank you, Convena. And I asked uh, the question of the previous panel, and although some of, most of you have, are in construction, uh, it's it's mainly to see that we've mentioned all the sectors that it could benefit. How do you see it benefiting individuals? The bill. You know, how do you see? I asked the question of the previous panel as well. I think I think the biggest benefit probably is that it it takes the law back to the concept that if you want to write down that someone will benefit a third party in a particular way, you can do that without having to go through conceptual loopholes as to whether it's irrevocable or not irrevocable. Um, and it should reinstate the concept of party autonomy. And if you're looking at the situation of private individuals and private contracts, um, they're often put together without the benefit of a lawyer or with, with limited advice. There may be family <coughs> arrangements. People can have more confidence that what they've written down will work. And that's got to be a good thing. I think anything that um, sets out the law in clear, understandable terms that individuals and, and businesses and, and anybody can understand is, is to be applauded, essentially. And I think, as we've said before, the, the bill strikes the right balance um, between protecting the rights of individuals um, and the rights of counterparties. And I think it, it's good, it's clear, it's easily understandable, and I think that, that's, that's an ideal position. Um, really to achieve. Can I just ask, it's uh, a totally random uh, supplementary question here. Uh, Mr Rose, you mentioned twice that New York law, and it was mentioned in the previous panel as well. Is there a particular reason why you mentioned New York law? <coughs> well, New York law is, I, I, I haven't got the statistics, I suspect it's one of the most widely used legal systems in the world, mm -hmm. New York law. I mean, it, New York law and English law would be the two most recognised international they're not international really, but they're, they're used internationally, internationally recognised um, commercial legal systems. Um, so for for large funding, commercial contracts, commercial arrangements. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't overemphasise the use of New York law in, in the context of, of Scotland, but it still is used. It's very much more relevant to international situations, but there may not be a natural legal system. You've got to pick a, you've got to pick a legal system among a number of legal systems. So New York is uh, is, is probably the most obvious US system and is, is probably the centre of legal activity in, in the US. So that's why I picked that, picked that one. But I mean, New York and, and English law are probably the two most obvious in that, that category. Um, and Scots law wouldn't be in that category. It is, it is occasionally used internationally, but it's not, in, it's, not, it's not a jurisdiction which for a variety of reasons would be seen in that same way as those other ones. Okay, thank you. 
Right. Um, thank you very much. Um, can I just ask a question on arbitration? The uh, previous panel had uh, quite specific comments on Section 9, um, which allows arbitration agreements between contracting parties to operate. Um, in respect of third party rights, do you have any specific comments on the arbitration and particularly Section 9? It's a good idea. Um, I mean, ultimately, if you've introduced a third party to your contract, what you don't then want to be introducing is the possibility for different dispute resolution me mechanisms. If something goes wrong, it will often go wrong in a complicated way. Um, the parties to the contract will be involved in a dispute potentially, as well as the third party. And you don't want to be in a situation where you've potentially got different forums um, for, for dealing with it. If you've chosen arbitration, you really want to know that you can pull everything into the same arbitration, both for confidentiality and cost and case management reasons. Is that a view universally shared by you all? Right, thank you very much. And finally, a question on the speed of law reform and from the evidence we've received, it seems that some of the problems in Scots law of third party rights have been in existence since um, the Second World War. Uh, on that basis, do you think there is an argument that the pace of law reform in this area has been too slow? You've heard the question before. Uh, what do you think? It's like a lot of things. That expectations are, are, are changed. People people expect the law to change now. I mean, in a lot of ways, most lawyers, I think someone said it earlier, are very conservative. We don't necessarily want... Change means it's less predictable. Um, but I think expectations have changed. I mean, I think that a, a common law system based on, on, on case law will progress slowly if there are not very many cases in those areas. And I think, we, you know, that's part of the reason this is a very sort of sort of finite point of law and hasn't progressed very fast so but I think that um, I don't think that you know the Scots legal system as a whole should be sort of you know beating itself up about its lack of reform but I think the, the right way to address this is for for the law commission to have looked at this and to develop you know modern legislation along the lines that they, they have done and that that seems to be the right thing to do thank you and any other the, the, the bare b the bones of the system are, are fine. Um, what, what emerges over time are periodic friction points where things have either not moved fast enough or they've moved too fast in the wrong direction. And it's, it's addressing those ones in a, in a measured way. That's probably the best approach. But it's best done in the round with careful consideration and looking at, be, because I, I agree with, with Kenny, the, it is a competitive business for which is the right legal system to choose. And so it's important to keep an eye on what everybody else is doing, because th that is a question you're asked. Um, if, if an international organisation is coming to Scotland and replicating its business model, it'll get out all its old contracts, whether they were written under New York law, English law or French law, and say, can we be confident that we can do exactly the same thing? Um, because that's what they want to do. They're replicating their business model. So. Um, you want to look at what, what you can do elsewhere and make sure that you're um, allowing people the right tools. Excellent. Um, well, if, no, if there's nothing further any of you wish to add, um, I would like to thank um, Kenneth Rose, uh, Karen Fountain, uh, Jonathan Gaskell and Karen Manning for giving up their time to come and give evidence to this committee today. We're very grateful to you for... Um, doing so, um, and as I said um, previously, if there's anything that occurs to you subsequently, um, if you would like to let us know, make us aware, and I mean, we will of course be uh, very grateful uh, of any further views that you may have or advice that you think uh, that you can give us. Um, in the meantime, I wish you a safe journey home and a snowy day, and thank you again for coming to help us today. Thank you very much. Now suspend this meeting just for a moment. <clears throat>
Right. Um, a final witness before us uh, today um, is Professor Hugh Beale from the University of Warwick. Uh, Professor Beale has reviewed the effectiveness of the equivalent legislation in England and Wales and therefore brings an interesting perspective to today's evidence. So, uh, Professor Beale, can I welcome you to our Scottish Parliament? Uh, thank you very much for taking the trouble to come and talk to us today. And um, can I begin um, by questioning you myself, and after that we'll move to other members of the committee. And could you possibly explain uh, the background to the 1999 <coughs> Act and the reasons why it was introduced in England and Wales. Thank you very much, Convener, and thank you. It's a, an honour to be invited to come and talk to the committee. The background, of course, is that in England we had no use quasitum tertio. Uh, you simply could not acquire rights under a contract to which you were not a party. And Sometimes uh, you get very simple cases, and this I think goes to the question that we just had about the benefit to individuals. We got very simple cases where people just did not realize that there was a problem. Um, the committee might have heard of a, an English case called Bezik and Bezik, which was a simple case where a man owned a coal business. He wanted to retire and sell it to his nephew, who couldn't afford to pay cash. So the agreement was that the nephew would pay his uncle the princely sum of six pounds ten shillings a week for the rest of the uncle's life, and thereafter five pounds a week to his aunt, the widow. And uh, the nephew stopped paying after the uncle's death, and it was held that the widow simply acquired no rights under the, under the contract because she was not a party to it. Now, I suspect the answer might have been different in Scots law because it may have be, been arguable that she had some kind of, of right. But uh, you can see that people get into difficulties because they simply did not realize that there was a problem. Um, the House of Lords was able in that case to find a solution because uh, although as widow she had no rights, the aunt also was the administratrix of her late husband's estate and in her capacity as administratrix, she was able to get an order an order of specific performance, our equivalent of specific implement, against her nephew, ordering him to pay her five pounds a week in her other capacity as widow. So it all ended up happily ever after, except that they had to go to the House of Lords to achieve that. Um, and that's the sort of uh, situation. Now, as f at the other end of the spectrum, of course, we've been talking mainly so far about uh, contracts which are made between very sophisticated parties with legal advice. And there, English law developed many workarounds, ways of achieving third party rights. But it involved a lot of difficulty in many cases, and the devices weren't always reliable. So there had been a long, uh, a long-term move to try to get our law changed. Indeed, the Law Reform Committee recommended back in 1937 that the doctrine of privity of contract should be abolished. Uh, I believe legislation was actually beginning to go through Parliament when the Second World War broke out and nothing was done thereafter. And for many years, judges in particular called on Parliament to do something and even at one stage threatened to do it themselves if Parliament wouldn't get on with it. But uh, as you'll know, the matter was referred to the Law Commission. So that the 1999 Act, uh, I think, was trying to meet a, a long-standing complaint that English law was uh, seriously defective, much more defective than Scots law is at the moment. Have I, have I understood you correctly in saying that this is a problem identified before the Second World War and it took till 1999 to, to resolve Correct, it? Correct, Convener, yes. It's embarrassing, I'm afraid, but that's what happened. <laughs> um. Um, right. Um, anyone, uh, anyone in my committee got anything to <laughs> they wish to ask Professor Beale in that regard or not? Not, I take it. Um, well, thank you for that introductory uh, comment. Can I now ask uh, uh, Mr Adam... Uh, to ask his question on the impact of the yes, 1999 Professor Beale, Act. you carried out the review of the operation of the 1999 Act in 2010. Can you explain uh, what, how you went through that, what we went through, and the conclusions that you made from that? Thank you. Well, I'm afraid it was a very informal review because it's actually very difficult to establish what use is being made of legislation. I think uh, Jill Clark made the same point last week to you, that it's very difficult to put figures on anything because um, 
you would have to do an enormous survey to try and find, uh, of every law firm to ask, you know, how many clients have ever asked for a contract which is to benefit third parties and so on. And although it, in theory it could be done, it would be extremely time consuming and costly. And you might run into problems about client confidentiality as well. So that all I did, I'm afraid, was at the request of my colleague Andrew Burroughs, who was actually the law commissioner responsible for producing the, the report from a law commission and seeing the legislation through, he, uh, he asked me to do a sort of 10 year review of the act and it seemed sensible to try and find out to what extent the act was being used. And I just simply contacted people that I had had dealings with while I was at the Law Commission and asked for their opinions. And I got a, a certain amount of useful information. But it's very difficult. Let me start, for example, with construction law. Um, you've been told about the use of collateral warranties and you've been told about the problems of the black hole. And I, when I looked at the standard forms of building contract, because we're, you, I'm sure you know we have the, uh, the Joint Contracts Tribunal standard forms of building contracts, um, which are rather equivalent to the Scottish forms, what I found was that these are now being redrafted so that there is provision either for the client to demand that the contractor gives collateral warranties, as, as the thing you've been discussing already, or that the contractor agrees that third party rights will come into existence. So it's there on paper. What we don't know is how often they use the collateral warranty approach and how often they use the third party rights approach and whether indeed sometimes they go for both at the same time, which would be theoretically possible. Um, the actual practical use of it is quite hard to establish. But in other areas, I'm told that it is very much used. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, one of the big problems has been trying to protect third parties from potential liability in tort. Let's suppose that you have a contract between company A and company B, and company B is afraid that perhaps its individual officers or its employees may, might be sued by company A if something goes wrong. They want to ex exclude those, the liability of those officers. That was possible to do through rather elaborate schemes, either using agency or by circles of indemnities. But now it's very easy, and I'm told that it's very common simply to provide in contracts that there shall be one party shall have no right of action against named individuals. Or another context where you get very much the same sort of thing happening is where you have uh, uh, contracts which are effectively made on behalf of a group of companies. So that you might, for example, contract for uh, services to be provided and you want to make sure that people in the different services, uh, different groups within the uh, the companies who may actually be the providers of the services because the work may be subcontracted out to other members of the group to make sure that they are protected. Now that's as it were conferring a negative benefit, protection on a third party. But equally you may want to confer positive benefits. So for example there might be indemnities which would be offered to officers or employees of the company or indemnities to other members of the same group of companies. And this is all much easier now and I'm told that it's done fairly regularly, though I'm afraid I can't actually give you chapter and verse in the sense that I, I, my inquiries were, were simply answered by we do this regularly, as it were. Collateral warranties and in, you said in some cases you do collateral warranties and the th uh, th uh, third uh, party indemnities or third party part of the law as well. Is, is that peculiar to construction? I think that collateral warranties are most used in construction, but I suspect that they've probably been used in other fields as well. For example, I think last week you were discussing the oil and gas industry, where you get again this problem of multiple actors. I'm afraid I can't tell you whether collateral warranties are used in, or were used in that sort of situation. I'm pretty sure that third party rights probably are being used in that situation where the contract's subject to English law. Because I get the distinct impression from the first, uh, from uh, uh, the, the woman that's in, with, with the construction industry, that the, the vibe and feel seem to be that, well, we work around it anyway. Well, We've got collateral warranties, we'll 
just and I compare the question I asked last week. Will some of these big corporate entities that are some of the legal firms just continue with their workabouts yes. there anyway? Yes, I'm sure that's right. And I, uh, as one of the previous witnesses said, uh, lawyers tend to be rather conservative and stick with the things that they know. And some clients are rather conservative and like the piece of paper that they've always had. But uh, what I've discovered is that more and more of the standard forms are allowing third party rights as an alternative to collateral warranties. And I suspect that that wouldn't be happening if there were no take up. So I, I suspect that some people are using third party rights, but we don't have any litigation on it and it's very difficult to actually establish figures. Whether they use both at the same time, I have no idea. That was just my guess that they might. Um, but the forms actually provide for one or the other. And I would imagine that that's more usual. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Adam. Uh, can I now ask uh, Monica Lennon to ask her questions? Yeah, thank please. you. Good morning, Professor Beale. I've been interested in what you've said so far. The Scottish Law Commission report indicates that there are few cases on the 99 Act and also that there's been a lot of academic criticism of the Act as well. Um, I wonder if you could expand on the reasons for the lack of case law and also the academic criticism of the Act and some of the reasons why you think lawyers are excluding the application of the Act from commercial contracts. Thank you. Um, well, I think that the, the criticism of the Act, if I may start from that point of view, is that um, it ignores a doctrine which fortunately you've never been cursed with, the doctrine of consideration. In English law, there are two reasons for uh, saying that a, a, somebody who's not a party to the contract can't sue on it. One is that if you have a contract between A and B where A makes a promise that they will do something for C, the promise is made to B, so why should C be able to sue on it? That's one reason. But the other reason is that in English law, for there to be a contract, there has to be some kind of exchange. In other words, B has to be providing something in exchange for what A is promising. And of course, normally speaking, it is B who is providing that, not the third party C. And most of the academic criticism has been simply that the reforms ignore the problem of consideration. Now, I, I have to say that most of us, many of us at least, just don't agree with that because there is always a contract for good consideration between A and B. The fact that C isn't providing any consideration if the parties intended to confer rights on C, seems to me to be irrelevant. But in any event, it's something which would not arise under Scots law since you have no doctrine of consideration and be grateful for it. Um, it's not something that, um, well, I would not preserve it if it were my world. <laughs> no, it's useful to get that, that clarity. Um, yeah. <laughs> in last week's session, which I think you may have been listening to, or at least you've read our yes. report, the Law Commission, um, also indicated that use of the 99 Act has been slow. Um, yes. Do you agree with that view? Well, there hasn't been very much litigation on it. There have been a number of cases, but as uh, uh, Professor McQueen said last week, it's very hard to know whether that's because everything is so clear there's no problem or everybody is so scared of it that they don't want to litigate over it. Um, my impression is that there haven't been any major problems so far and that people are actually coming around to using the act. Um, I can give you other instances, for example, uh, in uh, I, the area of IT. Very often a, a contract for IT will be made between the IT provider and one company in a group, but the services would be provided to all the other companies in the group. Now, I'm told that's very common. I haven't seen any litigation or anything like that arising from that sort of situation, which makes me hope, at least, that it's all relatively clear. Of course, the problem only arises if something goes seriously wrong with the contracts anyway, um, and it may just be by good fortune that nothing has yet gone wrong. Um, but I'm not aware of any major problems being thrown up by litigation, and I'm not aware of any other major problems with the Act. Okay. Just out of curiosity, from the previous um, two panels, again, we sort of posed the question about, you know, the policy memorandum is, is hoping there would be a shift to 
to using Scots law. Um, you, you know, you've heard a number of legal practitioners today. Um, are you quite confident that that shift would happen in time, or do you think there still would be um, sort of reliance and um, a preference to use? Um, English law, other law, or collateral warranties? Well, I've certainly heard that sometimes, sometimes, Scots law is being used, sorry, English law is being used when Scots law would be more natural to use, simply because of this third party rights issue. But it's only anecdotal evidence, and how frequent that is, I don't know. But it seems to me that it can only help the position of Scots law if it's kept up to date. Mm -hmm. And I think it's I mean, I, I'm not a Scots lawyer, but my reading of certainly of the Law Commission's discussion paper and report is that, that you know there are quite serious problems at the moment, particularly problems of uncertainty, and it can do no harm, can only do good to get rid of those. And it seems to me that the bill does a very good job of that. Um, That's very thank helpful. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Monica, as well. Um, can we now move to Alison Harris for her questions, yes. please? Good morning, Professor Beale. Good morning. Are there any general lessons which could be learned from the implementation of the 1999 Act? And do you think there are any ways in which the Scottish legal establishment could ensure that the uptake of the new rules happen more quickly than seems to have occurred in England and Wales? Um... I find that hard to answer. Um, it's a very good question, if I may ask, say so, but it's a very difficult one to answer because one doesn't really know whether the uptake has been slow um, or indeed what the sort of what one might expect. Um, I was told immediately after the act was passed that the only effect of this is that we're going to go through our bank of standard forms and everyone will have a clause saying the contracts, right, uh, contracts Rights of Third Parties Act shall not apply. And indeed, most standard form contracts do still contain that clause, but they also go on to say, except the following specific provisions where they want to create third party rights. And that's what's happening. I mean, it, it, it's very interesting that they are making the position absolutely clear by excluding the operation of the Act, but with very specific rights in favour of third parties. And uh, when, after 10 years, I found that this was beginning to happen, I was relatively relieved. I'm not sure that 10 years is a very long time uh, in terms of you know, uptake by practitioners for the reasons that were given earlier, that practitioners, having found a device that works, tend to stick with it, even if it's inconvenient. And there's no doubt that the collateral warranty business in construction, for example, is inconvenient for all the reasons that were explained by other witnesses, that you have to, may have to chase around after the event to issue collateral warranties to new purchasers or tenants of the building and so on, whereas it could all be done at once. So forgive me, but I'm not quite sure that 10 years or even longer now it does demonstrate a very slow uptake. It's gradual. But I think probably the, the answer to your first question was what could the government do? Um, I think probably uh, in England there was maybe a greater need for education of legal practitioners uh, than there would be here in Scotland simply because here I think the legal community is so much smaller and probably more cohesive. I imagine everybody knows what's going on, um, whereas that's not always true in England and Wales. Okay, thank you. Can I ask more something? What is your general view of the bill before this Parliament? You know, based on your experience of the 1999 Act, do you think that the bill will improve the law on third party rights in Scotland? Thank you. Definitely an improvement. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I would support the bill wholeheartedly. The, the only slight points that I noted to myself as I reread it on the train coming up yesterday was that in some places I think the bill is more sophisticated than I would have made it. But then 
English lawyers are rather crude compared to Scots lawyers. So <laughs> <laughs> but, so, for example, some of the provisions about when the, when the right remains revocable, even though the parties didn't say it was going to be revocable, it's a very ne neatly graduated system. We just have a simpler system of saying once you've relied on it, you can't, or once it's been, no once it's been accepted, it can't be changed unless there is a provision in the contract allowing that. It's a cruder system that we've adopted. Um, but there's, there's nothing wrong with having a sophisticated system, providing it's clear and understood. And I think it, by and large, the bill is pretty clear. I'm sure that ev everybody can make s slight tweaks of improvement, but I think it's a very good bill. That's good. Are there any areas where you think the 1999 Act provides a better solution to the problem of third party rights than the bill? Or alternatively, are there any areas where you think the bill is an improvement on the 1999 Act? That's very, very difficult. I mean, the, the differences, despite the differences in wording, the difference in substance are very small. And just occasionally, I thought, I think I prefer the English wording because I think it's a little bit clearer. I mean, actually, the principal one is just in the, in the opening provision about the, the contract being, um, if I may read clause, 1-1-A, a person who is not a party to a contract acquires a third party right under it where the contract contains an undertaking that one or more of the contracting parties will do or not do something for the person's benefit. Now, from the explanatory notes, I gather that's to be meant uh, to be read as saying that the contract, i.e. The, in most cases the document, will say this is for the benefit or indicate that this is for the benefit of the person. But I am not quite clear as to whether one might say, well, here is a provision which does in fact benefit somebody, although they are not mentioned in the contract. It's that sort of level of minor wording. That otherwise, I, I think that the, the bill does an excellent job. I don't see any major differences. There are one or two uh, Differences, for example, uh, in England, we've, ex we've prevented a third party from relying on the Unfair Contract Terms Act. Um, if you have a situation where party A promises the third party that it will take reasonable care and then limits its liability for example, limiting its liability for having done bad work to repairing or replacing the work, that might fall within section, I think it's 16.1b, I hope, I'm sorry, of, of the unfair, this is the Scottish section of the, of the Act, and I'm never, never quite sure of my numbers, um, of, of the Unfair Contract Terms Act. In England, we simply said that sort of term cannot be challenged by a third party. It's six of one and half a dozen of the other. I, 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 my initial reaction was I th think I would have preferred the English solution, but it, it's arguable either way, and I don't care to second guess what Professor McQueen and his colleagues uh, have recommended. They, they are very good lawyers, and uh, I have no reason to doubt their judgment. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate your answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you indeed. Um, and notwithstanding your deference to uh, Professor McQueen, which we share, of course, um, are there, uh, since we are endeavouring to make absolutely the best law we can, and, and since your review of the 1999 Act uh, and the, some of the shortcomings that you have acknowledged and pointed out, uh, are there any errors, mistakes that you see us potentially making um, because we want to produce the best bill we possibly can, self-evidently? Thank you, convener. No, I don't honestly think that. I certainly wouldn't say there are any mistakes. Um, there are one or two places where I think possibly the drafting could be a little bit clarified, but they're very much at the level of, of detailed drafting, and um, I, I think it would be better to feed in suggestions in writing later on, if I may. Would you? Uh, but it is very much just a question of how, how easy it is for somebody to, re to read the Act and understand what it's saying, and that's always a problem in legislation. Um, uh, I'm sure you're aware, for example, of the Consumer Rights Act, which was passed 
in 2015, which was supposed to make the law much more accessible to consumers. I find it very hard to read, I'm afraid. <laughs> Uh, so well, it's not an easy task. We'll, we'll leave uh, the Consumer yeah. Rights Act um, yeah. <laughs> to one side at the moment, but um, we would nonetheless be grateful if you would yeah. like to correspond with us yeah. in, 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 in any Thank area you, where you think we could um, benefit from um, yeah. your experience yeah. and wisdom. Um, um, I now want to ask uh, Mr McMillan um, to talk about, um, give us his question, please. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, do you do you agree with the, the general policy in the bill that the rules should normally be default in nature, so that uh, so that can be contracted out of? Thank you. Yes, I do. Absolutely. I think it's very important that the rules should be default rules in both directions, so that the party should be able to uh, reserve the right to vary or to even to cancel. <coughs> the third party's rights, but on the other hand, should be able to create <coughs> rights which cannot be cancelled, because although I don't have any concrete examples from real life, I think there may be situations where the third party needs to know from the outset that this is a totally irrevocable and unvariable right, so that it can then plan its own affairs. For example, if it is to have a right under an insurance policy taken out by another company in the group, that it should not have to worry about whether it's relied on it or not. It should simply be able to say, that's irrevocable, that's fine. Um, so I think, it, I think it's very important that these should be default rules f in both directions. Now, of course, um, in it, it's just possible that sometimes um, a contract involving third party rights might be made in favour of a consumer. And then, of course, the unfair terms in consumer contracts legislation, now part of the Consumer Rights Act, would cut in. And if it were uh, a, a clause which seemed to be unfair, allowing the, the third party to, to, uh, to have their rights taken away, then that could be challenged there. My only concern, really, I suppose, is that the clauses which allow a party to uh, vary the third party rights might not always be understood by someone who is not a consumer but is rather consumer like uh, the very small business but that's m part of a much broader problem that we couldn't po you couldn't possibly tackle in this bill about the need to protect very small businesses um, I still believe as the the joint report of the English and, and Scottish Law Commissions back in 2005 recommended that we actually do need some legislation to protect very small businesses from unfair terms, which doesn't exist at the moment. But that's a much more general problem. So basically, I think the answer is, to your question is, it's absolutely right that these should only be default rules. Uh, can I just ask you for a, a point of clarification, please? Yes, uh, your, your answer there, you stated, it's not a consumer, but it's consumer-like. Uh, I, I'm not a lawyer. No. Um, so can you, well, can you explain uh, that? Well, for example, um, we've had quite a lot of problems, in, uh, certainly in England, and I believe also uh, north of the border, with uh, corner shops making contracts, for example, to lease a photocopier so that customers can go into the shop and make photocopies and so on. And some of the terms of those leases have been very harsh. But because they are not technically consumers, because they're making the contract for the purposes of a business, they are not protected by the, uh, the unfair terms directive or the legislation that implements it. But yet they have no better understanding of what they're doing and no greater bargaining power, as it were, than a, a, an individual consumer would. That's what I mean by consumer-like, as it were. They're so small that they, in effect, don't have any expertise and they're probably making relatively low-value contracts, so they're not really able to go and take legal advice each time because the cost is disproportionate. That's what I mean by consumer-like. I hope that's clear enough. Uh, it is. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, the next question is uh, regarding sections four to six of the bill. Yeah. Uh, they stop the, the contracting parties modifying or cancelling uh, yes. party right. And based uh, on your experience uh, of the operation of the legislation in England and Wales, do, you, do these sections provide the right balance between the rights of contracting parties to change their mind and the rights of third parties? 
Yes, uh, thank you. I think they achieve a very sophisticated balance. This is the area where actually our provision is a little bit cruder. Uh, I think it's possibly easier to understand, but it's certainly not as sophisticated. And whether you care to be sophisticated or clearer but cruder, it's a matter uh, of judgment. And uh, that was one of the areas that I, as it were, put pencil marks against in the train. But by the time I'd Actually, by the time I'd got to Carlisle, I'd realized that really I, 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 there was nothing wrong with the bill at all. It's just that my approach is slightly different. So I would support them, absolutely. In, in terms of your, your colleagues, um, have you had any discussions with, uh, with other professors um, and uh, legal professors in terms of the, the, this Scottish bill uh, to gauge their opinion? as to whether uh, they feel as if the bill is uh, positive. Uh, I, I'm afraid I have to declare uh, an interest. I, 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 I spent last night having dinner and then staying with Professor McQueen, so I've been oh, thoroughly... Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, and I, I'm afraid I have not heard recently from any, uh, any professor other than Professor McQueen. Okay. So I, I <laughs> OK, no problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor, so we'll... Queen that got the razor for your pencil, man. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will, we will uh, assume that you've had the bill, the bill fully explained to you in that regard. Um, um, but just to take you back um, to um, your answer to Mr. McMillan's question, I think yeah. a moment ago when you spoke about the need for the protection of small businesses, and uh, was that um, in re following the, the 2005 joint review? Yes. Um, is that um, something that would more elegantly fit into another piece of legislation or be a piece of legislation in itself? Well, really what I'm asking is, if, since you have um, generously undertaken to correspond with us in terms of the improvements that we might make. Um, would you also add a note as to why that should be addressed um, from a, a perspective? Yeah. Um, and if you'd like to discuss that just a little further at the moment and put that on the record, why that needs to be addressed. Well, uh, thank you, Convener. It's simply that whenever you have, as it were, default rules, which can therefore be varied by the parties, and you have a situation where a contract appears to confer a benefit on the third party, but yet is subject to a variation clause of some kind, there is always the danger that the third party will observe the good bits and not be aware of the clauses which cut down their rights. And it seems to me that that is a danger that exists for small businesses in particular, because small businesses are not likely to uh, read and understand the contracts that they're signing, or they're even less likely than, than, than larger businesses. So it's just part of a general problem. I, it's not a problem that I think could be addressed in this bill at all. It's part of a, a more general problem. But that's my only concern, uh, which I wanted to express in, in response to Mr. McMillan's question, because you know he was asking me, did I think it was right that they should be default rights? And my answer is, absolutely I do. Um, but I hope that contracts will be drafted in such a way as to make it quite clear to the third party when their rights are actually subject to variation. Um, but as I say, that's a, a bigger question. I don't think it's something which could really be very sensibly dealt with in this bill. I mean, it would be possible to say that every clause allowing variation shall be prominent or something like that. But it would be rather odd to try to do that, I think, in, in this piece of legislation alone. Um, no, I wasn't really suggesting that, but yeah. nonetheless, thank you for your yeah. considered view on that. And can I just take you now to a question on arbitration and Section 9 on the bill and what's mm. your view on it, uh, which allows arbitration agreements between contracting parties to operate in respect of a third yeah. party? Well, I'm afraid, Convener, I have to apologise to the committee that I have not got any information about the actual application of, of that section. I'm not aware of it giving any problem, giving rise to problems. It seems to me to be a perfectly sensible arrangement, but it was all 
uh, drafted, uh, as I'm sure you know, after the Law Commission had produced its report. And I was a little bit involved as a sort of consultant uh, at the stage of the Law Commission report, but I wasn't involved in the discussion of arbitration and I don't have any information really about its use. I'm not aware of any problems, but that's as far as I can go, I'm afraid. Right, thank you very much. And just a final question on the speed of law reform and your, your answer to my initial question. Um, rather gave the game away that you perhaps think the speed of law reform has been a little too slow. Um, have you anything further that you would like to add in that regard and how we should proceed from here? Well, I think that it's now time to put this bill through. Um, I think it would be a much more creditable record than we have in England, where we started in 1937 and didn't achieve anything until 1999. Um, it, it's true, it's arguable that you've had problems since 1920, but I think that in reality, the, the, um, the problems have only emerged much more recently. It seems to me that uh, there's nothing to be ashamed of that, you, that it's taken a few years to get things done, but I do believe that now is the time to bring Scots law up to date, as it were, um, and we have, as it were, to some extent copied you. Now, maybe you're going to follow us, but you're very much following a model which in one form or another has been adopted in many jurisdictions. And I, I think it's an, an excellent proposal and I would support it wholeheartedly. Well, thank you very much um, for those Supportive comments. Um, um, we are hugely in uh, your debt, um, and we are hugely indebted to you for, for coming today um, yes. to give us evidence uh, on this uh, subject. Uh, so, can I thank you for thank you. for so doing, and, and wish you a safe journey home. Thank you. It's and been a indeed, privilege and a pleasure. Uh, look forward to receiving um, your. Uh, further um, reflections on on what we've discussed and indeed any reflections on anything else that we haven't discussed that you think would be relevant yeah. to enhancing uh, this bill. Um, so thank you very much and can I now suspend this meeting um, briefly to allow Professor Bill and others to leave. Okay, thank you.
Um, we now move to agenda item four, uh, instruments subject to negative procedure. And no points have been raised by our legal advisers on the instruments before us today, which are the Non-Domestic Rates District Heating Relief Scotland Regulation 2017 SSI 2017 number 61, or the Protection of Seals designation of haul-out sites, Scotland Amendment Order 2017 SSI. 2017, number 63, or on the representation of the people, absent voting at local government elections, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017, SSI 2017, number 64, <clears throat> or on the Local Governments Scotland Act 2004, Remuneration Amendments Amendment Regulations 2017, SSI 2017, number 6, or on the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland, Housing and Property Chamber Procedure, Amendment Regulations 2017, SSI 2017, number 68, or on the First Tier Tribunal for Scotland, Tax Chamber Procedure Regulations 2017, SSI 2017, number 69. And since no points have been raised by our legal advisers on these instruments, is the committee content with these instruments? Excellent. Thank you very much. I now move this meeting into private, if I may.